excellent uh, report and uh, apparently they said the new report would be coming out in uh, four to six months and sure enough here's the new report and I missed it it actually was released on April 19th so I'm a couple months behind on this blame your fuck control contingents uh, for me falling behind on this story because this is something I've been looking for for a long fucking time all right so this is the new report concluding that uh, GMOs do indeed cause cancer, uh, infertility, autism, uh, diabetes, uh, it's all over. This is uh, posted by Children of Vietnam Veterans uh, Health Alliance, and uh, you can read all of it. And here's the report. Okay, it's all in all the report. It is all here for you to read in full detail, giving you uh, pretty much all the details on uh, Roundup and things like that causing uh, cancer and everything else. So it is now 100% fact Roundup and anything Monsanto produces is a cancer causer. There it is. Been waiting a long time for this report, like I said, because the first report that came in was indeed inconclusive. Actually, Monsanto filed a lawsuit against the scientists. Uh, who put out that report and they actually had to retract their story and uh, they said they would come out with a new story and here we go here it is so I'll, I'll leave you the link for that you can read it and uh, make sure you're not eating those fucking Cheerios have a nice day hi everybody Dr. Robert O. Young's research validated on the toxicity of BT Roundup toxins from Monsanto's GMO corn juice causing red blood cell damage. So the healthy red blood cells before the injection of the live juice from Monsanto's BT Roundup GMO corn. The live blood 10 minutes after Dr. Young injected the live juice from Monsanto's BT Roundup GMO corn. I am absolutely positive I have seen these various colored shapes in my Morgellons photos and also videos. Scientists discover BT toxins found in Monsanto crops damage the red blood cells. The live red blood cell lysis with solidification of the BT Roundup GMO corn juice after 30 minutes and look how it solidifies right in the blood. Wow! Studies are showing that BT toxins found in Monsanto crops are harmful to mammalian blood by damaging red blood cells and more. Red blood cells are responsible for delivering oxygen to the body tissues through blood flow. Bacillus thuringiensis, or BT, is a bacterium commonly used as a biological pesticide. It is a microorganism that produces toxic chemicals. It occurs naturally in the environment and is usually isolated from soil, insects and plant surfaces. Prior to this study, Bt was thought to be toxic only to insects, but recent studies are proving otherwise. Dr. Mezomo and his team of scientists from the Department of Genetics and Morphology and the Institute of Biological Sciences at University of Brasilia recently published a study that involved Bacillus thuringiensis Bt toxin and its effects on mammalian blood. According to the study, the cry Toxins that are found in Monsanto's GMO crops, like corn and soy, are much more toxic to mammals than previously thought. 
The study was published in the Journal of Hematology and Thrombobolic Diseases. I'm not sure I'm saying that right, but we do not support animal testing and think it's unnecessary. It should really be a no-brainer that GMO crops cause significant damage to human health. Studies that don't require animal testing have already proven the dangers of GMO consumption. The study unfortunately required the use of Swiss albino mice if Bt was to be properly examined. At the same time, most of us know that the existence of GMOs is completely unnecessary. Advances in genetic engineering promise the expression of multiple cry toxins in Bt plants known as gene pyramiding. Therefore, studies on non-target species are requirements of international protocols to verify the adverse effects of these toxins, ensuring human and environmental biosafety. Due to its growing use in agricultural activities, Bt presence has already been detected in different environmental compartments such as soil and water. Consequently, the bioavailability of cry proteins has increased and for biosafety reasons their adverse effects might be studied mainly for non-target organisms. Studies are therefore needed to evaluate Bt toxicity to non-target organisms, the persistence of Bt toxin and its stability in aquatic environments and the risk to humans and animals exposed to potentially toxic levels of Bt through their diet. Thus we aimed to evaluate in Swiss albino mice the hemotoxicity and genotoxicity of Bt spore crystals. Wow! Scientists tested levels ranging from 27 mg to 270 mg over a seven day period it was remarkably evident that the cryotoxins were hemotoxic even at the lowest doses administered. Hemotoxins destroy red blood cells, disrupt blood clotting, and cause organ degeneration and tissue damage. The number of RBCs, red blood cells, as well as their size, were significantly reduced and so were the levels of hemoglobin for oxygen to attach to. Every factor regarding red blood cells indicated some level of damage for all levels of toxin administered and across all cryproteins. The tests clearly demonstrated that cryproteins resulting from the Bt toxin were cytotoxic, quality of being toxic to cells, to bone marrow cells, Studies continually show that these proteins kill blood cells by targeting the cell membranes of red blood cells. Wow! Cry1AB, the protein produced in common Bt corn and soy, included microcytic hypochromic anemia in mice, even at the lowest tested dose of 27 mg per kilogram and this toxin has been detected in blood of non-pregnant women, pregnant women and their fetuses in Canada supposedly exposed through their diet. These data as well as increased bioavailability of these MCA in the environment reinforce the need for more research especially given that little is known about spore crystals adverse effects on non-target species. Dr. Mezomo and his team are not the only group of scientists to discover harmful effects of Bt toxins. Professor Joe Cummins, Professor Emeritus, Emeritus of Genetics, the University of Western Ontario has also studied it. Two, three, four, he concluded that there is sufficient evidence that the Bt toxin will impact directly on human health through damaging the ileum, which is the final section of the small intestine that is responsible for the absorption of 
vitamin B12, he also points out that the Bt cryotoxin gene has not been proven to be the same as the natural bacterial gene. As mentioned in the first paragraph, it occurs naturally in the environment, usually isolated from soil, insects, and plant surfaces. It seems that every day brings forth new information regarding GMOs. We have so much evidence that points to just how harmful these foods are, yet they continue to be mass produced and corporations that develop them are constantly protected. The truth still remains. You still have a choice as to what you put in your body and the, they're encouraging everybody to read this, do further research. Okay. The National Security Act of 1947, July 26, 1947. To promote the national security by providing for a Secretary of Defense, for a national military establishment, for a Department of the Army, a Department of the Navy, and a Department of the Air Force, and for the coordination of the activities of the national military establishment, with other departments and agencies of the government concerned with national security, be it enacted by the Senate and the House of Representatives of the United States of America and Congress assembled. This act may be cited as the National Security Act of 1947. Declaration of Policy Section 2 In enacting this legislation, it is the intent of Congress to provide a comprehensive program for the future security of the United States Incorporated to provide for the establishment of integrated policies and procedures for the departments, agencies, and functions of the government relating to the national security, to provide three military departments for their operation and administration of the Army, the Navy, including Naval Aviation and the United States Incorporated Marine Corps, and the Air Force, with their assigned combat and service components, to provide for the authoritative coordination and unified direction under civilian control but not to merge them to provide for the effective strategic direction of the armed forces and for the operation under unified control and for their integration into an efficient team of land naval and air forces title one coordination for national security the national security council section 101 there is hereby established a council to be known as the National Security Council, here and after in this section referred to as the Council. The President of the United States shall preside over meetings of the Council, provided that in his absence he may designate a member of the Council to preside in his place. The function of the Council shall be to advise the President with respect to the integration of domestic, foreign, and military policies relating to the national security so as to enable the military services and other departments and agencies of the government to cooperate more effectively in matters involving the national security. Council shall be composed of the President, the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, appointed under Section 202, the Secretary of the Army, referred to in Section 205, the Secretary of Navy, the Secretary of Air Force, appointed under Section 207, and the Chairman of National Security Resource Board, appointed under section 103 and such of the following named officers as the president may designate from time to time the secretaries of the executive departments the chairman of the munitions board appointed under section 213 and the chairman of the research and development board appointed under section 214 but no such additional member shall be designated until the office advice and consent of the senate has been given to the appointment to the office the holding of which authorizes his designation as a member of the council. In addition to performing such other function as the president may direct for the purpose of more effectively and coordinating the policies and functions of the departments and agencies of the government relating to the national security, it shall, subject to the direction of the president, be the duty of the council to one, to assess and appraise the objectives, commitments, and risks of the United States Incorporated in relation to our actual and potential military power in the interests of national security for the purpose of making recommendations to the president in connection therewith and to to consider policies on matters of common interest to the departments and agencies of the government concerned with the national security and to make recommendations to the president in connection therewith 
The council shall have a staff to be headed by a civilian executive secretary who shall be appointed by the president and who shall receive compensation at a rate of $10,000 a year. The executive secretary subject to the direction of the council is hereby authorized subject to the civil service laws and the classification act of 1923 as amended to appoint and fix the compensation of such personnel as may be direct necessary to perform such duties as may be prescribed by the council in connection with the performance of its functions. The council shall from time to time make such recommendations and such other reports to the president as it deems appropriate or as the president may require. The Central Intelligence Agency or CIA section 102 a there is hereby established under the National Security Council a Central Intelligence Agency with a director of Central Intelligence who shall be the head thereof. The director shall be appointed by the President by and with the advice and consent of the Senate from among the commissioned officers of the armed services or from among individuals in civilian life. From the Guardian.com, Underwear Barmer was working for the CIA. Bomber involved in plot to attack U.S. bound jet was working as an informer with Saudi intelligence and the CIA. It has emerged. Scared you, didn't it? And this was not according to state security, which would be you. This is according to national security policy maintained by Congress. They are putting you into fear so that they can protect you, but they're the ones preying on you. National security applies to corporate policy. It's a corporation. A foreign nation is not a sovereign state. 28 U.S.C. subsection 1603. For the purposes of this chapter, a foreign state, except as used in section 1608 of this title, includes a political subdivision of a foreign state or an agency or instrumentality of a foreign state as defined in subsection B. B. An agency or instrumentality of a foreign state means any entity which is a separate legal person corporate or otherwise, and two, which is an organ of a foreign state or political subdivision thereof, or a majority of whose shares or other ownership interests is owned by a foreign state or political subdivision thereof, and three, which is neither a citizen of a state of the United States as defined in section 1332 C and E of this title, nor created under the laws of any third country. The United States Incorporated includes all territory and waters, continental or insular subject to the jurisdiction of the United States Incorporated. D. A commercial activity means either a regular course of commercial conduct or a particular commercial transaction or act. The commercial character of an activity shall be determined by reference to the nature of the course of conduct or particular transaction or, or act rather than by reference to its purpose. A commercial activity carried on in the United States incorporated by a foreign state means commercial activity carried on by such state and having substantial contact with the United States incorporated. From Amjur 2D Bills and Notes 1. Definitions Nature of Commercial Paper Subsection 1. Generally Bills and Notes in their various forms are contracts and may be negotiable or non-negotiable. Bills and notes are commonly defined as commercial paper or negotiable or non-negotiable instruments. 2. An internal commercial paper. Commercial paper is commonly defined as negotiable instruments, drafts, checks, certificates of deposits, and promissory notes. Commercial paper is governed by provisions in, of Article 3 of the Uniform Commercial Code. Subsection 2. Contractual nature of negotiable instruments. Bills and notes are in modern terminology drafts, checks, notes, and certificates of deposits or contracts. Accordingly, the fundamental rules governing contract law are applicable to the determination of the legal questions which arise over such instruments. An instrument may be negotiable, and while not removed from the law relating to contracts, such an instrument constitutes a commercial specialty. A negotiable instrument is distinguished from an ordinary contract by incidents having their foundation in the law merchant, which in most jurisdictions has been in large part codified by statute, first in the Uniform Negotiable Instruments Acts and subsequently in the Uniform Commercial Code. Subsection 3. Generally, the law merchant. The law merchant is the law which confers negotiability on commercial paper and governs negotiable instruments. 
More specifically, it is the pre-statutory or non-statutory law which govern bills of exchange, promissory notes, and namely the Lex Mercatoria or the Custom of Merchants. Subsection 4. Uniform Negotiable Instruments Act. The Uniform Commercial Code supplanted the Uniform Negotiable Instrument Act, which was promulgated in 1896 as the first uniform law by the National Conference of Commissioners on Uniform State Laws and was in force in all of the states of the United States until superseded. The act was largely a codification of the rules of the law merchant or the common law rules relating to negotiable instruments which previously were enforced in effect by virtue of judicial pronouncement or legislative enactment. Its purpose was to establish certain fixed rules governing negotiable instruments and to bring about a uniform system of laws on the subject and thereby do away with the confusion that had existed in the law of commercial paper. The Uniform Commercial Code, Subsection 5. The Uniform Commercial Code has been enacted, at least in part, by every state in the United States Incorporated and by the District of Columbia and the Virgin Islands. The Uniform Commercial Code is arranged in 10 articles. Article 1 contains general provisions, Article 10 is the effective date and repealer article, and Articles 2 through 9 are each concerned with a particular type of commercial activity. The Code as a whole is known and may be cited as the Uniform Commercial Code. The Uniform Commercial Code, as proposed by its sponsors, the American Law Institute and the National Conference of Commissioners on Uniform State Laws, is accompanied by extensive comments, explanatory of and correlating the various code provisions. From Black's Law 8th Edition, Jerry Justionis, by way of doing business, a nation's acts that are essentially commercial or private in contrast to its public or governmental acts. Under the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, a foreign country's immunity is limited to claims involving its public acts. The statutory immunity does not extend to claims arising from the private or commercial acts of a foreign state. 28 U.S.C.A. subsection 1605 See Commercial Activity Exception Restrictive Principle of Sovereign Immunity. Jerry and Perry. Jerry and Perry is by right of sovereignty. The public acts that a nation undertakes as a sovereign state for which the sovereign is usually immune from suit or liability in a foreign country. Again, see the Restrictive Principle of Sovereign Immunity. The Restrictive Principle of Sovereign Immunity. The doctrine by which a foreign nation's immunity does not apply to claims arising from the nation's private or commercial acts, but protects the nation only from claims arising from its public functions. Uniform Commercial Code is just a conglomeration of private and commercial acts. You just saw it in Amger itself. What the hell are we consenting to this stuff for? The United States Incorporated is a corporation. They're only adhering and acting as to acts of commerce and private acts which disallow immunity or any amount of sovereignty. You are the United States lower case and you are with full sovereignty and immunity. You only adhere to the public law, meaning do no harm. So we went into depth on the 1947 National Security Act and we need to go further along on the timeline to see the fallout of this or the expected result, the predetermined outcome. On April 24, 1974, Dr. Henry Kissinger proposed in his memorandum to the National Security Council that depopulation should be the highest priority of United States incorporated foreign policy towards the third world. He quoted reasons of national security and because the U.S. economy will require large and increasing amounts of minerals from abroad, especially from less developed countries. Wherever a lessening of population can increase its prospects for such stability, population policy becomes relevant to resources, supplies, and to the economic interests of the United States Incorporated. This is what launched the depopulation program. The targeting agency for the operation is the National Security Council's ad hoc group on population policy. Its policy planning group 
as in the U.S. State Department's Office of Population Affairs established in 75 by Henry Kissinger. The OPA, or Office of Population Affairs, is actually the United States Department of Health and Human Services. OPA is a leader in family planning and reproductive health care services training and research. Okay. Now this all began as eugenics or genocide, but now it's soft sold to you as family planning because it sounds nicer. From blackgenocide.com. Dot org, sorry. At a March 1925 international birth control gathering in New York City, a speaker warned of the menace posed by the black and yellow peril. The man was not a Nazi or Klansman. He was Dr. S. Adolphus Knopf, a member of Margaret Sanger's American Birth Control League, ABCL, which along with other groups eventually became known as Planned Parenthood. I'm going to make you pause here because you need to realize this is 1925, well before Hitler. Now, during this time, corporations were just taking a heavy, heavy burden of all of these populaces and all of these human beings, and the overhead was really, really great. And so, such as Bear Corporation came in in 1927, July 26, 1927, to ask the World Courts, which is maintained by Congress, to indemnify Poland. It had nothing to do with racism. It was corporate overhead that they wanted to cut. There's a permanent link here, www.worldcourts.com, PCIJ, slash ENG, slash decisions, slash 1927.07.26, space, chores out, C-H-O-R-Z-O-W, dot H-T-M. The citation is Factory at Chorzow, in parentheses, Germany versus Poland, 1927, PCIG, Series A, number 9, July 26. So what is really the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services? It's a eugenics program. So when you're seeing this from Russia Today, for example, NSA bugged UN headquarters in a report, that's to throw you off because what's actually occurring is information. You're applying for welfare. You're applying for Social Security. You're applying for licensing and titles. And what this is, is that is the National Security Program. You are the underwriter underwriting policy. You are guaranteeing these revenue streams through the insurance schematic subject to their laws because you're still claiming to be a citizen of this corporation. You can only be a product of a corporation. I mean, to get you buying into this idea that you're bad, you're overpopulating yourselves, and, you know, you're polluting the planet, you're bad humans, bad, bad, bad. But we, Congress, we know what's good for you. So we're going to make depopulation our highest priority just for you. It's called genocide, people. We found them guilty of that. We found them guilty of genocide. Human trafficking and genocide. Now, does it get any worse than that? Do I have to... How many more ways do I have to say this?